This is the uh, Senate Environmental Natural Resource Finance Committee, today, Wednesday, March 23rd, 2022. Um, members, we have, uh, and welcome everybody, everybody that's here. Uh, we have before us, I think, five bills today, most of which will be held over except for one. Uh, and the first bill is, and I think I've seen a box of donuts in the back, I'm not sure. Is this your first bill before the committee? I think it's Senator Rosen, please. 3738, welcome to the committee. And you have some testifiers with you. I do, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. I didn't know I was supposed to bring those. We this. will talk about that later. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chair, maybe I got one. For, maybe I got one free one now. You know, <laughs> I got a bill coming up. Can you tell me which bill will be laid over? Uh, or, I mean, which going, is going forward? Uh, the uh, Westrom bill, Senate File 3792, has to go to capital investment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I owe you this whole committee a box of donuts, and I, uh, no. I work really hard to get in front of your committee at least once a year. So Senate file 3738 is a bill for tourism in Minnesota, Mr. Chair and members. Allocates 1% of the lottery in lieu to explore Minnesota tourism, and it creates a new account, the uh, um, events promotion account, which 50% would go to Greater Minnesota, 50% to the Metro. In section two of the bill, it requires, as I said, 1% of the in lieu tax imposed on the sale of lottery tickets to be deposited and to the state treasurer and credited to the events promotion account. And then that would be basically um, $470 million for 2024 and $490 million for 2025. There is also a one-time investment. I think that's uh, excuse me, 1,000. Did I say million? I'm used to dealing with millions and billions, and I didn't mean to say. You're scaring me. Scaring me. <laughs> is, is, that, is that the A1 amendment? <laughs> They'll take it. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Ooh, yeah, it's on my it's on my notes. It's a million too. I um, where was I? So and then also it it, um, it has a one time investment of a million dollars. That's section three, and that would to to attract and promote large scale sporting and other events in Minnesota, and that would be a 50 percent to Greater Minnesota and 50 percent to the Metro. This would, uh, Mr. Chair, members, be an ongoing funding source which is needed for Explore Minnesota instead of sporadic funding. It's a guaranteed funding source for tourism. And just like um, every year the legislature appropriates out of the count on line 3.12 of the bill, but this would be a new count at the very bottom there. Uh, it also has one grant specialist to the Explore Minnesota Tourism uh, that would administer the program. And with me, I have Doug Carnival and Wendy Blackshaw, the CEO of Minnesota Sports and Events. Thank you. Mr. Carnival, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm on the executive board and legal counsel to Minnesota Sports and Events, which is the organization that will be uh, using this money to promote uh, uh, major sports and other events in Minnesota. And just your name for the record, please. Yeah. I'm sorry, Doug Carnival, Grand Shea Carnival Law Thank Firm, you. Mr. Chair. I should know that by now. Um, Minnesota Sports and Events is a Minnesota not-for-profit corporation. Uh, Tax-exempt status uh, has been acquired. We've, uh, we formed the corporation a year and a half ago to uh, help promote major sporting and other events in Minnesota to aid in tourism and to help bolster Minnesota's economy. Uh, other states that we compete with uh, have funding that is provided by the state to augment their private sector fundraising, um, true public-private partnerships in many of these states. Uh, some of them, as you'll hear from Ms. Blackshaw, are quite extensive. So we see there to be a tremendous benefit to Minnesota to bring major events here. The Women's Final Four that you hear about is, uh, is the one that's imminent, and that's going to be a, a tremendous event for the state. So state funding, obviously, is, an, is important to our efforts to effectively compete for these major events uh, with other states around the country. So I'm going to turn it over to Wendy Blackshaw, our CEO, who's going to talk about what made Minnesota Sports and Events mission is and how, what it's doing to accomplish that mission. Thank you, Ms. Blackshaw. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and Senator Rosen, and of course, Doug. Um, Wendy Blackshaw, CEO of Minnesota Sports and Events. I am just going to take you really quickly through a deck, if I can get it to 
switch here. Mm. Well, for some reason it is not moving. There we go. Okay. So who is Minnesota Sports and Events? We were formed um, 18 months ago as a 501c6, and the reason that we were formed is the CEOs of the Convention and Visitors Bureaus of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Bloomington realized that we really needed to come together in a cohesive way to bid on and execute these mega events. We all know about the Super Bowl, Men's Final Four. We are so excited because Women's Final Four is happening next week. We're gonna be welcoming tens of thousands of people um, back to our region, and, and we're so excited about that. Our goal is to bid on these events, win these events, because they bring significant economic impact to um, our market. Um, tourism, this is what brings people to fly into our airports, they stay in our hotels, they eat in our restaurants, they shop in our retail. Um, as I said, next week you'll see a lot more people in town because of Women's Final Four, and we want to continue to do that. This is what brings sports tourism into the market. We also have legacy initiatives that we work on, and just for example, for Women's Final Four, we have done a statewide reading program. We are building a basketball court in a school in North Minneapolis, every single event that we bring into uh, the market will have a legacy community component to it. And then obviously, reputational. These events are really important to us. Um, every event like Women's Final Four has a national broadcasting component, so we are going to be on ESPN next week constantly, and they will talk a lot about Minneapolis, Minnesota, what a great place this is. And we want to change the narrative back to this is really a great place to live, work, and play. So who is involved in Minnesota sports and events? This, these are the logos of the people who are on our board. We're very fortunate to have a really great board of directors. I will not go through the entire list, but you can see that this is a great group of people who are doing this because they really care about the community. Um, we are a nonprofit. We are not generating revenue. We are just here to put on these events and bring this economic, reputational, and community impact to the market. So accomplishments to date. We've been very, very busy. As I said, we've, we're executing Women's Final Four next week. It starts on Sunday with a um, huge fan fest out at Mall of America. We did the NHL Winter Classic in January when typically hotel occupancy is very low. And we saw an increase of 266%, so great example of how these events really make an impact. Um, we've got the MLS All-Star Game coming in this coming summer. And then we're a finalist in four different events, and we will be making those announcements if we are, um, we are picked to host these events. We will be making these announcements very soon. And you can see, Special Olympics USA Games will bring in 74 million, um, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 50, 50 to 60,000 fans and athletes. And we also are a finalist for Big Ten Women's and Men's Basketball. So, all of these events are going to be have a great impact on our state. Um, in addition to that, we've bid on 30 different events in the past 18 months, so we are constantly bidding on events. Um, Men's Final Four, Women's Final Four, once again, are up for bid, and we're working on those as well. One of the reasons that this is important as well is because, um, and I apologize for the very small font, um, <laughs> one of the reasons this is important is because the pandemic has really hurt the hospitality industry, as you, you know. So these events do bring people back into our hotels. They really impact that industry spe specifically. A lot of people have lost their jobs throughout this pandemic, and so we are really working to bring people back in so that we can get people to shop in our stores and eat in our restaurants. This just shows hotel occupancy um, between 2019 and 2020, and you'll see that obviously we took a huge hit and we are just now starting to build back. We've got a long way to go. Um, Senator Rosen mentioned the competition, and this is a really important point. We are constantly in competition with places like Indianapolis, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 
uh, Detroit, Michigan, and we are losing bids to some of these cities. We shouldn't be because we are an amazing place with a phenomenal reputation of putting on these really great events. The reason we are is because these places all have funding models. They have long-term sustainable funding. What we've been doing up until this point, I, I worked on the Super Bowl and I raised $54 million to put that on through corporate sponsorship. Um, for Women's Final Four, we've raised um, close to $4 million to put that on as well. And that money goes back into our city back into our state. So we are paying for police, we're, we're paying for security, we're paying for the convention center. So the money doesn't go to a league or go to, to the NCAA, it stays in our city. So the money that, that is being raised actually, um, it, it's important I think to understand that. But these other markets do have different funding mechanisms um, that will help us to, um, if, or, or they hurt us because they have funding in place and, and we currently only have the corporate sponsorship. We are looking at a um, public-private partnership. We will always have that, that sponsorship, those sponsorship dollars, but we can't sustain by funding these completely through, um, through corporate sponsorship. And I think it's also important to add that you know, these, these events, the ones that we're talking about right now, do take place in um, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Bloomington, you know, the, the metro area. But there are always components of it that will be also in outstate. As I mentioned, we have legacy components. We also do a lot of promotion, like we did around Ryder Cup, where people came here to go to Ryder Cup, but then we promoted golf all over the state of Minnesota. So this really is a statewide initiative. Um, for Super Bowl, we did 52 weeks of giving all over the state of Minnesota. So it is our goal to really make this not just about the metro area, but also about a statewide initiative. So we're talking about short-term funding. Um, in the short term, we, we are currently, I am the em employee for Minnesota Sports and Events, and so we are looking at a short-term funding to get our operations up and running. And then, as I mentioned, we're looking at permanent long-term funding so that we can at least help to support the corporate sponsorship money that is going into these events as well. And this next slide just shows you what is possible if we are able to get to um, get some funding in place. These are all events that are out there and that we are currently bidding on and the economic impact would be over $1 million. So we feel it's really important that um, hopefully we can, we can move ahead on this. So thank you. Um, any questions? Thank you, uh, Ms. Blackshaw. And uh, Senator, do you have any other testifiers? No, that's it, okay. uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, no, that was a, quite a presentation. Um, and bring back a little bit of a memory from my former life uh, when I was a sheriff. Uh, we actually co-hosted the International Special Olympics here in, in uh, the Twin Cities area. And if you want to talk about a heart-wrenching uh, event to be at, uh, uplifting event to be at, that was it. And I was able to work it along with my wife uh, being a nurse for the medical. Uh, although you had to have interpreters wherever you went, it was quite challenging, but uh, it, it certainly brought in an awful lot of people. So I, I understand what big numbers are brought and, and uh, no question. Uh, members, any questions? Senator Rood. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Rosen. Um, I think I, you aren't going to be surprised that I have grave concerns about this bill mm -hmm. and going forward. And one of the biggest surprises is, and I'm all for tourism, um, Senator Bach and I created the Explore Minnesota Tourism Council back in the 2000s. And so I've sat on that council for a very long time. And I'm very passionate about that and what we bring to Minnesota. And so I was really surprised when this bill came to be a couple weeks ago. Um, and the stakeholders had not been talk to about this. I had the executive director of Explore Minnesota Tourism Council in my office, and we were both very surprised. Um, she had no idea that this bill existed and that they were included in it. And I think I had Ms. Blackwell and Mr. Carnival in my office, and they were also surprised that the bill had been dropped so fast and before anyone could be talked to. And so I, I think that that's problematic for me when the stakeholders are not involved in a bill that comes forward to this body. Um, I will also tell you I was very surprised that the policy committee 
was bypassed on this bill and then it came directly here because as you know at two weeks ago we had a terrific um, committee hearing in the policy about lottery and lieu and we had Bob Lassart and we had uh, a whole host of people come and talk about the lottery and lieu bill that we had in the policy committee that was heard and that was referred to this committee uh, weeks ago and uh, that bill is still out there and that's very important and I think uh, we got uh, coverage in the Star and Tribune and the Outdoor, Her uh, Outdoor News. We did a, a capital report on how important it was that the lottery in lieu money is really important part of the environment and what it was the constitutional amendment that was put forward. Um, this afternoon in my committee I have uh, the reenactment or the reinstatement of the um, the lottery and lieu bill, the constitutional amendment, because it has to be put back on the on the ballot, and we'd like to get that done this year. I think I would have a very hard time making the argument to the voters in Minnesota that now the environmental money is going to sporting events. I don't think they ever thought that it would be de doing that. I think it's a very dangerous path to go down that you now start taking the lottery and lieu money and fund sporting events. Um, I think the sporting events are wonderful. They, they do bring wonderful dollars here. This is just not the funding source to do that. So Senator Rosen, I have grave concerns about this bill and how you're spending the money and that the stakeholders in this bill were not consulted or talked to or even myself who sits on the Explore Minnesota Tourism <coughs> Council um, and that this bill bypassed the policy committee because it's very definitely a big policy issue. Mr. Chair. So, Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, thank you, Senator Brood. But uh, actually, I'm the one who is surprised because this is the first time I've heard of any dissent on this bill. And actually, um, your comments about me not reaching out to the Explore Minnesota Executive Director is wrong. I sat down with her on Zoom with my CA and had a very good meeting. And no one came to me and told me that there was trouble with you, Senator Root, about this bill. Now, actually, I do feel that sporting events, you're just narrowing in on the sporting events. I'm looking at tourism as a whole. If you consider a bass fishing contest <laughs> a sporting event, okay, or a musky fishing contest, sorry, Mr. Chair, or a curling contest, or anything that I consider a resource or a natural resource for Minnesota, not part of tourism, and shouldn't be funded ongoing, well, that we're just going to have a difference of opinion on this. But I do believe that this is a perfect place to support our one of our resources in Minnesota, and we should be very proud of this, and why not have a dedicated fund uphold and, and, and be the foundation for a, a, all these events that we could have coming to Minnesota that really benefit this state across the entire state. Thank so you, I, I'm sorry you were misinformed, but I had a very good conversation with her, and you never came to me, Senator Root, so this is where we're going to have a problem. And, and Mr. Root, Chair, Mr. Mr. Chair and Senator Rosen, um, I had the executive director in my office, and I do have an email from her um, on how surprised she was uh, that this bill was dropped and included in Explore Minnesota Tourism. So um, I, that, that's my information there. Um, and I think as the chair of the committee, when you put a, when you put a bill in, um, it would have been e a very easy conversation for you to have t with me. So um, we'll probably differ on that. Mr. But chair. I, you know, I'm not sure where Senator Explore Rosen. Minnesota has problems with this. They're getting $76,000 to execute as an administrator for this program. I, I'm not sure where the problem is with that, but I did have a very good conversation with her. And perhaps she does not agree with this, but uh, I also know her past experience. She was a lobbyist, and now she's the director for Explore Minnesota Tourism. Mm -hmm. And we are giving her a tremendous amount of money to execute a activity that's the betterment of this entire state. <clears throat> Members, we're going to move on here. We do have other questions, but I'd like to go to uh, uh, Mr. Mueller with regards to how this is going to be set up. And, and uh, uh, Mr. Mueller. Mr. Chair, before you move, I would like to make a motion. You'd 
you like to make a motion? Uh, well, yes, Mr. Chair. We'll, we're going to have a discussion before we make motions. That would be fine. Uh, the I motion is relevant. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The motion is relevant to Senator Rood's com uh, comment. So I, I think it's pertinent that I present that motion right now. Okay. What is your motion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am um, concerned, uh, Senator Rosen, about this issue as well. And uh, I believe that we do need to have ample conversation in Senator Rood's committee. I would like to hear more about that. Um, so I would like to present a motion that this bill be re-referred to the Committee of Natural Resources and Legacy, Mr. Chairman and members. Mr. Chair, comments? Senator Rose. I believe that um, your jurisdiction is for the Lottery and Lou and not Senator Rude's committee. Is uh, that, that correct? That's correct. Uh, any, any financial appropriation uh, has to come through my committee. Uh, and sometimes uh, um, it'll slide by. We'll understand that once in a while. But uh, this is the appropriate committee. It would eventually end up here. Yes. So. Uh, Ms. Mr. Mr. Chair. Um, I, if I may speak Senator to Rube. that, um, the lottery in lieu bill that I had went to the policy committee because it's a major policy change. And this would also be a major policy change. And so I think it's really appropriate to come through the policy committee first before the, uh, the finance committee. That's the way we've always worked this. M Mr. Chair? Okay. I apologize for that. Got a little advice. So, um, so your motion, uh, would you repeat your motion, please? Or maybe the staff can do that. Uh, Thank the motion you, is that, that it goes to the, back to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think this is not a debatable yes. I am referring this to the Committee on Natural Resources and Legacy. And the reason for it is that it does provide the establishment of a natural, of a a new account, it says in there, a separate account in the Natural Resources Fund, and that is under the jurisdiction of that committee. And so I also would like to call for a roll call on this. Well, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a motion on the table. Uh, to the motion, uh, I would ask for people to not, or members to not support the motion. Um, Senator, you just talked about setting up a financial um, um, situation here in, in the budget uh, in, uh, and when that happens it has to be done in this committee not policy committee. Policies committee deals with policy and policy only, only not with financial. Uh, in, in light of the <clears throat> I think the light of the uh, uh, guidelines, not guidelines but deadlines that we're up against here too is, is certainly going to be a factor. So um, any further discussion on the amendment? Uh, but uh, we'd start out with the roll call. If not, is there any further uh, uh, comments from the members? You can go ahead and take the roll. Chair Anderson? Chair votes no. Vice Chair Root? Yes. Senator Torres Ray? Yes. Senator Dibble? Yes. Senator Eaton? Yes. 
Senator Eichhorn? No. <laughs> Senator Lang? No. Senator Tomasoni? Senator Tomasoni? The reason for the delay is we're trying to attempt, attempt to get a hold of Senator Tomasoni, his communication has been very well up to this point, and, and uh, uh, we're just going to be. Mr. Chair, it was really fun to hear Senator Tomasoni uh, testify. Yeah. And in in my committee. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, he used a voice uh, modulator, and he actually spoke with us in the committee, and it was really, um, it was really amazing to hear his voice when uh, Senator Bach presented his bill. Anybody able to make any connection? Senator Bach, this is rather unusual. Is, is, is somebody in connection with him, do you know? Okay. Thank you. Sounds like we're making a connection, members. Uh, we get, we'll hear back here real soon. <clears throat> can you hear us? No. Yes, we can. Okay, I have that computer here. No. So go ahead and ask Senator Tomasoni about how he votes. Does he understand the uh, understand the motion? He voted no. no. Okay. And that's all, members. On a yes, on a, excuse me, on a uh, vote of four yes and four no, it's a tie. <clears throat> so the motion does not prevail. Members, moving on, do you have further questions? Senator Eaton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, Senator Rosen, I'm uh, a Rosen. I'm really disappointed in this bill. Um, we just got the, uh, the funds uh, cleaned up from when we wanted to use it to support uh, the, the uh, bonding um, funding for um, uh, funding uh, 
sewage systems in northern Minnesota. But um, this is not what people voted for when they voted for this uh, uh, amendment to the Constitution of the state. They knew that this money was going into the environment. Uh, this takes money from the DNR, which uh, does the, for activities like parks and trails and game and fishing. And um, it sets a really bad precedent for future funding for DNR. Um, how would you go about protecting natural resources funding in, the, if, in this funding stream if you were to start this? Is that a question, Senator, Senator Rosen? Yes. Senator Rosen. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Eaton. Um, this is a very small portion, 1% of the lottery in lieu that comes in. I think, I think people are losing sight of the benefit that this is going to happen to the entire state. And I remember this discussion that we had when we were trying to pass the, uh, the stadium bill, Mr. Chair. Do you remember that? I do. And the people who voted no on that were the very people from Minneapolis and St. Paul in the metro area. And it was the, met the greater Minnesota members that carried that bill through, through the very end, where it's the people that work at the stadium and those events and the tax base are from the metro area. So I'm, I'm just very surprised that this bill, who we are trying to focus some money to greater Minnesota, and obviously there's going to be a lot of attention in the metro area on something like this, and we are capitalizing and promoting our God-given uh, resources, I, you know, I'm just, I, I really feel like this lottery in lieu is a perfect example for um, an, an avenue and resource for the Explore uh, Minnesota Tourism Department because we want to be the best stewards of the money, absolutely, and I do feel strongly that that, that um, department can do that. But they have been hit. They've been hit very, very hard. So why not give them an opportunity to support each other and, and, and really get some momentum going? Mr. Chair? Follow up. Thank you. Well, Senator Rosen, I just, I don't disagree with your purpose. I disagree with where you're getting the funding. There is, we have a $9 billion surplus. There's absolutely no reason to raid the environmental DNR fund to um, fund this. It's a, um, this is not what people voted for. This is just another fund that um, was dedicated to the environment, which needs all the funds it can get with the climate change, et cetera. Um, and we don't need to be raiding it for sporting events. Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, who's asking? Mr. Chair. Mr. Carnival. The way I understand the bill's uh, language, it takes 1% of the lottery in lieu of money out of the general fund, which is some of the lottery in lieu money goes into the general fund, some of it goes into the environment. Yeah. This takes 1% out of the general fund, puts it into the environment fund, and then uses it for this purpose. So it's not taking any money that's existing in the environment fund that's currently being allocated and used. It's adding a 1% into the pot. Thank you. Now we'll get some more clarity from uh, Mr. Mueller. And then Senator Dibble, I see your hand is up. We'll go to you next, and then we're going to move on. Um, Mr. Chairman and members, yes, the, the way this, um, the funding works, currently 72.43% of the lottery and loo money goes to existing natural resources accounts. One is the heritage enhancement accounts, then there's two state, there's a state parks account, a metro parks account, a trails account, and then another account for the zoo, the zoos. So what this bill is doing is taking an additional 1% of money that would otherwise go to the general fund, and it creates a new account for the Board of Tourism. Right. So it's not affecting the, the, the amounts that are currently going to, to those other park accounts and the zoos and the trails. It's taking 1% of the money that's going to the general fund um, and creating a new account for that. And it would be about 400, so it would be a less, the cost part of it to the general fund would be less revenue going into the general fund. So it would be $470,000 in fiscal year 23 of less revenue going into the general fund 
and then $490,000 in the tails per year. And that amount would go to a new account in the Natural Resources Fund that would then be appropriated within this committee's jurisdiction. Okay. Senator Dibble, and then we're going to move on, members. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, and um, I appreciate that clarification, um, but um, what, what it interrupts is, is an effort, um, kind of a widely shared effort spearheaded by um, Senator Rood um, to stop diverting a, a lot of those lottery in lieu funds uh, into, the, into the general fund and kind of get back to their, their intent. Um, you know, I understand. You know, the, you know, I understand how the lottery and came about in the first place, um, and then a lot of it got diverted uh, into other purposes. So, I just wanted to say very quickly to Senator Rosen, I love your bill. I love the idea. I think it's a, a package of really, uh, really fantastic initiatives. Um, uh, you know, sh you know, and you're getting me there on the source a little bit, um, but I, I do share the the concern about the source and was just kind of, you know, I know that that you're you're leading the effort to pay off the bonds for the U.S. Bank Stadium early, which is fantastic. I love that idea, too. Um, and I know that you've also said, because I heard you on the radio say, you know, we can talk about how to use resources that flow from the electronic pull tabs tax um, later. Let's just, you know, try to take care of this uh, important opportunity that we have. But I do wonder if this might be a, a good place to go for uh, funding the fantastic initiative that you're presenting to us today. So just a thought. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Rose. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I appreciate that uh, comment from Senator Dibble about that. Once we get that that um, stadium paid off and on, on the way, I, absolutely. I think those are um, wonderful opportunities. There's a lot, of, a lot of opportunities there, but our responsibility is to paying that stadium off. And, and I understand that the managing of the of the taxpayers' dollars is uh, allowing us to, to be able to pay that off early, mm -hmm. which is always good, and that's that's many millions of dollars. And I should also note that uh, there's comments about uh, taking away from the uh, the environment. Folks, we all know how many millions and hundreds of millions of dollars we spend on trails, on on just uh, you know. Uh, Dollars from legacy from legacy funding for environmental and natural resources, uh, the DNR funding. Uh, uh, it's just endless, endless amounts. This idea that we're not stand, spending anything on our clean water and air here in Minnesota is, uh, I, I don't can't even imagine where that comes from because uh, they're not paying attention. Whoever's making those comments. So, with that, members, uh, we're going to lay this over. And thank you, Senator Rose. I'm thank not you. sure that a million dollars is quite enough, actually. So. It was 470 um, mil billion. Million. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. No, Mr. let's stay with Chair. the millions. Thanks. <laughs> and, and, Sen and Mr. Chair, I would just like to uh, uh, note my opposition to this bill and ask you in the future, I have a bill that came way before this bill, 2766, also Lottery Lou, that we would have an equal conversation about that bill in this committee. Okay, members, we're going to move on to uh, Senator Westrom. Senate file 3792. And I understand you have testifiers with you, Senator? In my back pocket. In your back pocket. No, I think uh, they'll be joining by Zoom. It might be on Zoom. Okay. okay. All right. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, just confirming with your staff, I believe the, the Beardsley uh, drainage bill is the first one? Um, uh, it is the uh, ring levies construction appropriation, yeah. Oh, ring levies, okay. Yep. Then uh, those testifiers think might be here. Um, if they are, they can come forward. Otherwise, go ahead with your bill. So, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, um, if the, the bill uh, with the ring dike levies uh, in front of you is a bill to uh, appropriate about $360,000 uh, to areas in the farmsteads in the Red River Valley where uh, maybe other uh, drainage or um, uh, holdback or flood easements uh, just don't work because of the topography. And so in, uh, in rare cases, but there are some where 
a ring dike levy around the, the property, the home, or the farmstead is, uh, is part of uh, the solution to help mitigate flood risk and flood issues in the Red River Valley. Uh, Boyd Sioux Watershed is on the south end of the, the Red River Valley Watershed. Part of my district, the western edge of the state of Minnesota, Traverse County, Wheaton area, uh, covers part of Stevens County, part of Grant County, uh, all the way up, uh, going up into Wilkin County, uh, which is the Breckenridge area uh, members, which is the uh, headwaters uh, of the Red River, and that continues to flow north, one of the uh, rare or few few rivers in the world that flow the wrong direction, if you will. Um, but uh, members, uh, the Red River is a, a, a certainly a big uh, uh, water source, a big river in our area. Uh, the Red River Valley. We've had you've heard many things many times over the years. The flood issues that go on uh, from time to time. Uh, we continue to work on improvement and having more uh, places for the water to be stored or held temporarily through natural and other impoundment uh, projects that have gone on. And so uh, this is a piece of that puzzle as we continue to try to uh, mitigate a flood risk for uh, property owners, for farmers, for those rural residents uh, that otherwise, uh, and other than uh, every so many years, uh, find themselves in a couple of weeks or a month of a, a real soggy situation the, the rest of the year and the rest of the decade, uh, in many cases, or decades. Uh, it's not an issue, but uh, there's times where the ring dike is the most cost effective, and that's what this bill does. So, Mr. Chair, happy to have uh, the testifiers. I, uh, Are there any testifiers uh, here or on Zoom? Yes, Mr. Chair, this is Jamie Byer from the Boyd Sioux Watershed District. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and go ahead. Go ahead. Mr. Chair, committee members, this is Jamie Byer, Boyd Sioux Watershed the district administrator, um, everything that, that Tori said, I couldn't have said better. We take the state funds and we leverage those with the Red River Watershed Management Board, who also kicks in for these ring dikes. And then the local watersheds, of which there are seven involved in this project, also participate. And then the landowners themselves will, will chip in some cost. And so like Senator Westrom said, it gives us some flexibility to put um, some safety and um, resource protections for folks into places that um, frequently flood. And, and these areas change as the climates change. And so like Senator Westrom said, sometimes impoundments are the answers, but these ring dikes are, are easier to install and they immediately protect and they're at a much smaller scale. So we thank you for the support. This program's been going on since 2000, and since that time, we've put in about 300 ring dikes up and down the Red River Valley. Thank you. Thank you. Any other testifiers, Senator Westrom? Uh, I, not that I'm aware of, but uh, I just double check with your committee administrator if All right. there's any others. Members, any questions of the testifier or about the bill? I've traveled to Red River Valley, as you know, Senator, many, many times, and and uh, see ring dikes all along there, and and uh, it's, it's quite an amazing, amazing thing for a private person to have to do that along the river. And uh, but I understand this is a 50% match. Is that correct, Senator? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I believe that's right. I'd ask uh, Council to just confirm that. Mr. Mueller. Isn't that how you read it, or, or uh, Mr. Stanley? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Westrom, yes. The language in the bill says the grant may not exceed 50% of the cost of the project. Correct. So there would be at least a 50% or a one-to-one -one match. Okay. Senator Dibble has a question. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't have a question. I just wanted to make a quick observation. Um, I want to indicate to Senator Westrom I'm supportive of this bill. I think my taxpayers would be happy to send money out to Western Minnesota to the Red River to help with uh, these flooding issues. Um, just like we're happy to send money all over the state to help with all kinds of infrastructure issues. Um, but we've seen uh, a number of these uh, flooding, stormwater um, uh, issues come. Senator Rosen has had several. I think we had Senator Dames, a few others, um, you know, these one-off um, helping communities that, that can't quite um, 
uh, uh, you know, pay the full freight of, of what are really, really expensive projects for flooding that has picked up in pace and will continue to pick up in pace with climate change. And um, the governor has a fairly comprehensive statewide uh, climate adaptation and resiliency initiative. I don't think we've yet heard it, Mr. Chair. Um, and so um, I just would, uh, again, as I've said, if, when we've heard those other bills, um, we need to think about uh, a statewide approach uh, to addressing um, what is happening. Um, you know, we're not gonna, even if we succeed at slowing and even, re and even reversing our contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, um, you know, climate change is upon us and it's gonna continue to happen before it slows and ultimately hopefully subsides. That's gonna be a long time from now. So we need to invest um, on a more strategic, comprehensive, intentional way on a statewide basis, or else it'll, we'll forever be chasing these one-off, one-at-a-time projects. Um, and I don't think that'll be efficient, and that'll also only be the path for um, powerful and influential senators to get their projects, and others will be left wanting, and that wouldn't be fair to Minnesota. So um, I would just encourage us to take a look at the governor's initiative, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, and I will. Uh, members, any other questions or concerns on the bill? Senator Western will be holding Senate file number 2798 over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank, thanks to uh, Ms. Beyer for her contribution uh, as well uh, from the Bois de Sioux, and members, uh, appreciate your consideration. Next up, we have, uh, don't go too far, we have Senate file 3792. Senator Westrom, it's the Beardsley Drain Line Replacement Appropriation. And, and Mr. Chair, um, I believe we have another testifier that will join us from by Zoom from the Upper Minnesota uh, uh, water, Minnesota Watershed uh, as well. But let me uh, uh, tell you about this bill and the request, uh, Mr. Chair. And I think we have an amendment, but I think it would be maybe best to do that after we hear the sure, testimony. Sure, go ahead. Um, uh, members, this is... Uh, a drainage uh, issue out in the Brainer, uh, Beardsley area in Big Stone County. Uh, years ago when I was first in the House of Representatives uh, following the 1997 uh, uh, record snowfall year and uh, quick melt rain that came in and uh, just uh, caused lots of uh, flooding issues if you recall, but one of them that was unique was in Beardsley, uh, one of the first projects I worked on in the, when I was in the House of Representatives and a lake that did not have an outlet and for years and years hadn't been an issue and for, for inexplainable reasons uh, this lake continued to grow and uh, come up but it wouldn't, wouldn't seem to recede like it had, has uh, done and um, long story short uh, we were working with all the melt that year uh, the city of Beardsley, uh, many were experiencing, uh, most of them uh, were experiencing uh, uh, water levels in their basement that uh, couldn't be stopped. The uh, city was kind of in, in, on the edge of uh, having most of the community uh, flooded out uh, from this uh, rising lake, uh, dry lake they call it, ironically. And, um, and, and so the, the, the best solution was to have a, out, a flow out or an outflow uh, on this lake. Uh, which was about two to three miles to the nearest drainage, uh, natural drainage way, Mr. Chair. And so, uh, long story short, FEMA had come in with uh, some federal dollars and other dollars were used to install this uh, two and a half to three mile uh, drainage uh, tile, uh, some parts down 20, 20 plus feet deep. And uh, our testifier will, will, will share a little more on that. But uh, a few years back, uh, the farmer experienced a sinkhole in his field and didn't understand. They went to investigate to figure out what was going on. And uh, uh, over the time, uh, now uh, 20, 20 plus years, the, the installation has settled in a few areas and uh, it looks like it needs to be replaced uh, to help uh, shore up this drainage uh, outlet for uh, the city of Beardsley and uh, this upper Minnesota watershed area. And so, members, uh, this bill would be a request to help uh, with some of the cost of uh, repairing this drainage line um, 
since this was first put in, which was around a million dollars, the costs have gone up uh, since the late 90s, uh, and they're talking about three or, or, or more million dollars now to uh, cover it, three to four million, as I recall, but I'll look to, to Amber, uh, who's going to join us to testify on this. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, that's a little background about this issue, where this drainage issue uh, has come from and the repairs that are needed to, uh, uh, they've temporarily uh, gotten some excavators out there and uh, put some patches in the drain pipe, but uh, they've scoped it and also found that it's uh, settling in, in, in different areas. Um, apparently there's no recourse to the contractors uh, that uh, put it in in the first place, uh, and uh, they're, they're looking to put in PVC pipe or more secure product that uh, wouldn't be so subject to settling as the cement culverts were that, uh, that were put in. And so, um, but literally uh, they could they could see down to the pipe and the sinkholes and uh, all that dirt was was flowing off uh, into the to the drainage uh, area and so we want to also stop that and uh, get dry lake uh, back to its uh, system that has worked very well to keep the city uh, protected and uh, the the levels in dry lake uh, at a at a workable and reasonable level so with that I'd be uh, happy to uh, have our testifier uh, share a little bit more about it. Senator Westrom, I think you've described the, uh, the, uh, the bill well, and you also have the A1 amendments, an author's amendment. Uh, in your description, uh, that now includes uh, uh, $2 million appropriation. It, and, and Mr. Chair, the amendment will change it to GO bonds <laughs> instead of cash. That's uh, right was one time I thought maybe you had a piggy bank sitting around under your table up there, but uh, uh, that was supposed to be a joke, members. But uh, anyways. <laughs> well, it was uh, a good one. <laughs> um, everybody anyways, knows, the amendment everybody would change it to $2 million dollars GO, and, and, and I'd urge, ask you to re-refer it to the bonding committee. We know the bonding committee uh, chair is, is here, and he carries a large checkbook, so uh, that's probably true. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's why it will be referred to. Uh, but uh, members, uh, Senator Westrom, it's an author amendment, uh, A1 amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Senator, your bill is in order. Do you have a testifier you said I, again? I I'm believe, I believe uh, Amber, the director at Upper Minnesota, was going to join us. Okay. Amber, she, are you there? She with us. Please Hi. identify yourself. Welcome to the committee. Good morning. Uh, I'm Amber DeShadis, administrator for the Upper Minnesota River Watershed District. Um, Senator Westrom did an excellent job of kind of overviewing the current conditions of the outlet for Dry Lake. Um, I think I'll just jump kind of directly then to um, what would probably be our plea. <laughs> um, an appropriation to the city of Beardsley would provide us with an opportunity to really um, be a little bit more flexible in how we choose to repair and replace the system. Uh, we could look at holding water on the landscape in additional areas, um, which would then likely decrease the size of the necessary pipe needed. Uh, we believe that that 36 inch uh, reinforced concrete pipe, um, you know, designed in 1997 under emergency action uh, was just designed in a way that, you know, doesn't hold up to the rain events that we see nowadays. You know, these, <clears throat> excuse me, four or five inch rain events um, we've then got water flowing through this system in addition to water from infield, kind of trying to infiltrate through these, um, you know, concrete culverts that weren't tied and we assume weren't really bedded to, you know, today's standards. Um, I'd like to note that the city of Beardsley's population is around 181 folks. Um, an assessment to repair and replace the system would, would really cripple the city. And so, um, you know, this appropriation would really help alleviate some of that financial burden. Um, and that's all I have for you. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. It's amazing that um, we have such challenges here in, in, in our committees. That we have bills coming forward because of the drought. We have bills coming forward because we have too much water, and it's quite a Quite an amazing state when you think about it. Uh, members, any any questions at all about the uh, about the bill as amended? Senator Westrom, any final comments? I, I don't, Mr. Chair. I uh, just uh, appreciate your time and, and indulgence, and uh, appreciate uh, having it passed over to the 
Bonding Committee. Okay. Senator, Senator Lang moves that Senate file 3792 as amended to pass and refer to the uh, Capital Investment Committee. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. same sign. Thank you, Senator Westrom. You're off to the uh, Finance Th Capital you, Investment Chair. Committee with that one. Yeah. Mr. Chair, if I Oh, I'm sorry, that. Senator Dibble, did I miss you? Well, I was a little slow on the draw. So okay. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to say um, that is the nature of climate change, Mr. Chair. It's, it's, it's better, you know, people used to call it global warming. It's better known as uh, climate confusion. Um, and, uh, and it's going to result in droughts, and it's going to result in floods, and it's going to result in extreme cold weather and extremely hot weather. So, um, so that's, that's why we're going to have to see all kinds of problems coming forward that relate to um, you know, all kinds of upheaval on, on our landscape. Points very well taken, Senator, and, and we, we know that you are certainly a proponent of paying attention to, uh, to that particular issue. And I know you, it was global warming at one time, now it's climate change, but you said it's referred to what else? No, I'm sorry? Climate, uh, climate confusion. Climate, climate confusion, climate okay. Climate yep. chaos. All right. I think that's a pretty good, actually pretty good description. So thank you. Members, we're going to move on to uh, the next bill. Senator Thomas Sony, Senate File 4052. And I understand Mr. Senator Bach will be presenting the bill. Uh, Senator Bach, welcome to the committee, and you have a testifier. Well, Mr. Chairman, since, since Thursday, I find myself taking steps back in time when I hear conversations or bills, and I... I have to tell you, on Senator Rosen's bill, uh, I was in the other body at the time, and uh, <clears throat> I remember my senator, Senator Johnson, was the tax chair, and I can remember a meeting in Senator Johnson's office where uh, Senator Lassard brought in the, the notion that on the lottery tickets that were sold, that that's a taxable transaction, and the sales tax is embedded in the dollar ticket. And so a bill came forward that acknowledge that, that this 6.5% at the time of, of the dollar that's collected in the lottery sh really should go to the state's general fund. And uh, the legislature agreed with that, and we made a change that, that moved 6.5% uh, of that dollar ticket over to the general fund, and then we made a, that legislature made a decision about how they wanted to spend it. And this legislature certainly has the authority, I think, to spend that money any way they want to. I don't, I don't think we own the precedent. Uh, of, of uh, something that happened in the 90s, but uh, clearly that was the intent, is it's a taxable transaction and 6.5% should move over to the general fund for the legislature to spend. And I don't believe that's, uh, that, that's a question of the Constitution. So, because the Constitution amendment didn't say we're going to charge a dollar for the tickets. So anyway, I just wanted to get that out there for, for all the members to hear, because I was part of that uh, conversation when that happened. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's good to have that institutional knowledge. I, no I, question I, about it. I bring to you, Mr. Chairman, a, a bill on behalf of Senator Thomasoni. It's been around this committee before. We've appropriated money to do the planning for this. Uh, there is an old um, mined out mine pit uh, just outside of uh, the, the city of Buell, Minnesota, in Itasca County, where uh, and, and all the old mine pits are filling up with water. The old natural ore mine pits, and uh, it's just a how much water just depends on where the water table is. And in the case of the can of steel pit, uh, the water table as the uh, mine is filling up is going to be higher than the city of uh, Beauvais. And at some point in time here, the city is going to flood. So we're going to have to enter into uh, some kind of a mitigation strategy to try and re relieve some of that water out of that mine pit. So the DNR has done the, we've appropriated the money for the pre-design. This is the bill for the money for the actual construction. Uh, of, uh, and, and I'm not sure if it's a pipe or what it is, but, but, but and DNR could maybe testify to that, but uh, Mr. Chairman, there is an amendment, and, and what the amendment does is it acknowledges that as the DNR works on the alignment of what I think is going to be a pipe, uh, I guess it could be a trench, I'm not sure, is that they, they're going to have to acquire land in that corridor and what the amendment does is acknowledges that if there's not a willing seller there, that the, the department, consistent with 
the terms that MMB sets forward in bonding would be able to enter into a long-term lease for any, some portion of that corridor uh, where the water is going to be diverted. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, that's uh, – and then it also makes the appropriation uh, – not expire at the end of the biennium because it, it this may take longer than two years to construct, so it pushes the uh, the actual use of the money out an additional year to three years rather than what normally would be two. So, Mr. Chairman, that's the uh, A2 amendment. Okay, so, member, I think members have finally got that and it's online. Is that correct? Yes. The amendments, the A2 amendment. To get the bill in order, uh, Senator. Bach offers the, uh, it's an author's amendment. The I'm not amendment. on the committee, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry? I'm not on the committee, Mr. Chairman. Someone else has to offer. Oh, that's, that's right. I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Eichhorn offers the A2 amendment to uh, Senate File 4052. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same aye. sign. Mr. Chairman, I have one of our Itasca County Commissioners from Senator uh, Eichhorn's district here, and uh, I've known him for a long, long time, uh, decades, I think is fair to say, and I'm pleased that he made the trek to St. Paul, and, and as I presented my bills and Senator Tomasoni's bill, I've made it pretty, pretty clear that if it's important, you probably should show up here. Uh, this is a people business, so I really appreciate that uh, Commissioner Trent has come down to kind of give you a Put a face on what the, what the city of Bovee is facing. We appreciate that as well. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, my name is Leo Trunt. I am District 3 Commissioner in Itasca County. And uh, our chair, uh, Terry Snyder, had some other pressing uh, issues as well, and he sends his regrets. But uh, I'm here to speak on behalf of this bill. Uh, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, this issue has been going on for a long time. You know, the, the Iron Range has been mined uh, for many, many years, and uh, the waters took care of themselves either through the natural flow or else as piped out and pumped out by the mining companies. But in the 80s, they all shut down and left the area, and the water started to rise. Uh, when I first came on the board on Itasca County in 1991, people came to me and said, what are you going to do about this? And I said, I don't know. So we started a committee. We, we formed a joint powers board known as the Western Misabi Mine Planning Board. And this board is made up of various jurisdictions from Cohasset to the west all the way to Kiwatin on the east as part of the Western Misabi. Various townships and cities as well as Itasca County are members of that board. And that board is basically a planning agency trying to deal with various issues such as the rising waters and other mining issues that are related to that complex. Um, since then, uh, you know, we had an issue of the rising waters and the state had worked on that issue and had uh, worked on building a, a kind of a French drain, as it were, in the city of Beauvais. The basements were flooding and there were other issues that were going on there and so that French drain was built in 2011 and as such it uh, it kind of helped the situation and then we had a mining company that came in there for some scram mining issues and they pumped some of the water down used it in their process but then shortly thereafter about a year year and a half they they left the area they went, they went bankrupt and so the water started to rise again this water is rising, it's been known as a, a legacy or pre-reclamation group of mine pits. They're north of Coleraine and Beauvais and Taconite. And the water has created a situation that is necessary to protect the public safety and the property and water quality. The current water level has already reached the desired safe outlet elevation. There should be no further delay as this water will continue to rise at a rate that we estimate at five to seven feet per year, unless control measures are installed. As you know, any additional water will just simply add cost to this project. None of the local impacted communities, townships, or the county for that matter, have funding for this kind of construction, uh, the lease for properties, O&M for the project, nor do we feel that it is their responsibility. Waters of the state are a state responsibility, and we feel that this is also a state responsibility because of the land, the minerals, and the stockpiles are substantially owned by the state of Minnesota, which controls metallic minerals in the state and by state-associated entities. Also, the state of Minnesota controls all permits regarding the water, the air, and future use of these properties. The state has gained from past taxes to this property, as well as stands to gain in future taxes, lease, and royalty fees in any future production taxes paid from the iron ore resource. 
Given the projected time needed for construction and placement into operation, funding should be provided for this during this legislative session. We feel it is a critical issue. The flooding, the wet basements, saturated soils, and increased property and infrastructure damage has already occurred between 2005 and 2010, especially in the city of Beauvais. The establishment of the French drain um, temporarily stopped this drainage, but now the drainage of some tile is becoming overwhelmed with the higher water, and within the next two years, unless the proposed system is constructed, money was appropriated during the 2020 session for pre-design, design and engineering work done on the Canisteel and Hill Annex outflow projects. Priority was given to the Canisteel project with any remaining funds that would be used on the Hill Annex, which is another complex that is also has rising waters. Senate File 4052 and its companion, House File 4423, provide relief from this and mitigation of the current and pending flooding. Overall planning and basic design has already been completed to create a safe outlet, but needs funding for the leasing, construction, operation, and maintenance of this outlet. We'd like to share that I task County fully support Senate File 4052 and asks for your support to mitigate this important situation. And I'm open to any questions. Thank you for that, testimony members. Thank you for that testimony, members. Any any questions of the testifier, Senator Root? Well, Mr. Bach and Mr. Trunt, um, this has been going on for a very long time, is it not? Because I think I recall Senator Thomas Owing bringing a whole group of us up to look at this issue, and we all had um, wonderful pasties at the Hill Annex Mine. <laughs> so um, I, I really hope we can get this done, because it seems like this has been a project long in the making. Mr. Chair, member, uh, Senator Rood. Go ahead. I, I totally agree with that statement. Um, you know, we, we thought we had it solved. And we were on the process, DNR was in the process of building this discharge to uh, Prairie River at that time in 2010. But because of the mining operation, the scram mining that was taking place at the time, and the efforts that had been done on the French drain in Beauvais, they, I, I suppose they thought that that was a solution and the mining companies were taking care of it. But as you know, mining is up and down and that company failed. And so then there was no more pumping by them for their, their process. And so now the waters are continuing to come. So. Senator Tomasoni. Mr. Chairman and committee members, thank you for hearing this bill. It is an important issue and is a good bill and I would appreciate your support. Thank you, Senator Bach, and thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Thank you, Senator. M Mr. Chairman. I believe he said it was a good bill. He said it was a good bill, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <laughs> uh, I beat you to the punch on that one. Mr. Chairman, I know some people have, have asked, well, why doesn't the IRRRB take care of this? And I, I just want everybody to know we do a lot of mining reclamation at the IRRRB. The, the, the current law is that mining companies, when they mine, they have to reclaim the slopes and, and the banks of anything that they mine out. The old mines that needed reclamation before there was a requirement of mine on reclamation, the IRRRB has been doing and we're still doing today. Uh, we used to grow about 600,000 trees a year in our growth chamber at Iron World uh, for reclamation purposes. Uh, we don't do that any longer, but uh, we do spend a lot of money on mine land reclamation. The mining companies spend a tremendous amount of money on mine land reclamation. But the water issue doesn't belong to the mining companies. It doesn't belong to uh, the IRRRB, it's under the jurisdiction of the DNR. And this really is a, 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 a DNR situation, and it's, it's unfortunate that it's taken so long and created so much anxiety for so many people, but I, I really hope that, uh, and I know Senator Thomas hopes, Thomas only hopes we can get this issue resolved for those people that live in that vicinity. Thank you, Senator. I have one more question. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's great to hear from Senator Tomasoni. I was on that trip too, so I've been up to see the mine, seeing it, uh, the mine pit, seeing it filling up, and it's uh, it was a really fun trip, um, and it's beautiful. And actually, the the pit filling up is 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 really beautiful. It's got this beautiful water, um, and uh, I certainly support this, and you know want to take care of Ovi. Um, 
hometown, I think, of, uh, or that's where our friend Lauren Solberg hailed from, if I remember correctly. And, and also, a little trivia fact, um, the Minnesota official painting of Minnesota, the man, you know, praying uh, over his bread and his Bible was, was I think, originates from Bovee. Um, but uh, Senator Bach, you, you, you touched on um, a question I know my constituents are going to ask me, which is, um, you know, why aren't the why aren't the mining entities responsible for uh, solving this this problem? And, and I've, I've actually never really had a good answer for that. Um, does it just predate uh, um, the time in which we made these requirements of the of the mining companies um, to to clean up them after themselves, or is this just an understanding that? that this is something that's left in the public realm to resolve after mining operations are finished? Or how do I respond to that question? Senator, Senator Buck. Mr. Chairman, I think, you know, DNR might be able to respond to that better than I can. But, you know, the, the mining dates back to 1881. And there weren't, you know, in the, the early decades of mining, there weren't requirements on reclamation. And we didn't have requirements on reclamation for a lot of things in addition to, to mining. So there's a lot of really, really old uh, mine pits uh, that predated any requirements for uh, reclamation issues. Some of, many of our cities on the Iron Range draw their water out of these mine pits. They're, some of them are a thousand feet deep. They've become incredible fisheries uh, uh, for, for uh, cold water fish like uh, trout. And uh, they say they're not making lakes anymore, but we're still making them up there. And there's going to be uh, when, if, if, if and when U.S. Steel ever gets mined out of Mintac, there is going to be a spectacular lake 20-some uh, miles long currently, and once it fills with water 1,000 feet deep or more, uh, that will be amazing. And there's been visioning going on, uh, and we've spent money at the IRRB about the long-term visioning of what happens to the development and the, as those slopes are all uh, uh, reclaimed after the mining what we're the try to figure out where the water table is going to settle so that uh, uh, someday the public will be able to enjoy those and they'll look, someday they'll look like lakes. Uh, so uh, because of the reclamation that's happening today, but uh, Senator Double, I don't have a good answer except that so much of this all predates uh, any requirements in law for companies to do reclamation, uh, and that's why we've got closed landfills all over the state. We've got all kinds of. Uh, environmental problems from previous days when we didn't have the kind of requirements on businesses that we have today. In this case, it's not an environmental issue. It's just a water table issue. Thank you. Any further questions, members? Thank you very much. We'll be holding it over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members. Senator Root, I'll have you take this one. This Senator Ingerbretson, Thank Senate, you, Madam Chair. Senate File 639, when you're ready. Madam Chair, six, Senate File 639, uh, as you know, I'm sure uh, Madam Chair has uh, been around certainly since the last session. It includes uh, 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 things, uh, includes sec, uh, things with regards to the Pollution Control Agency, clean water policy uh, uh, modifications. I do have an amendment. A delete all amendment, Madam Chair, that I would like to offer before we start. That's the A3 amendment to Senate File 639. Members, uh, sent the A3 amendment is in your packets. Um, Senator Ingerbretson offers the A3 amendment as an author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion carries. Senator Ingerbretson, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the bill is in order. Um, there are a lot of policy uh, issues here, uh, different sections, as you can see, um, and also some, some uh, money issues when it comes to fees and, and the potential of some, uh, some financial implications here uh, with regards to fees. But I'm going to turn it over to uh, 
my testifiers. Uh, we'll start out with uh, uh, Mr. Quillis. Mr. Quillis, thank, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and proceed when you're ready. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, members. My name is Tony Quillis. I'm the Director of Environmental Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, and I will be short, Madam Chair. I know there is a floor session, and I want to make sure that Ms. Pratt and Mr. Wedstein get to make their comments and get them on the record. But as Senator Ingebrigtsen referenced, this bill uh, of the 13 sections in it, 11 of them passed the Minnesota Senate last year, and I will run through them very quickly and stop on the two that are new from this year. But sections one and section nine deal with unadopted rules for the Pollution Control Agency and the Department of Natural Resources. Section two deals with water fees and asking for legislative approval of those in sections two, four, five, six, and eight. Section 3 deals with uh, wastewater treatment plants. Uh, previously, the legislature had granted municipal wastewater treatment plants 16-year permits. This would add industrial permits to that. Section 7 deals with the permit efficiency reports that are due by the Pollution Control Agency. This would ask, we uh, a couple of years ago, when we first started them, they were twice a year. We moved it back to once a year. This would ask them to come back to twice a year and provide a couple of more details in terms of permits that have been completed and permits that have been received, and then tease out, if you will, industrial and municipal um, permits. Madam Chair, to continue on, Section 10 deals with um, petitions for environmental assessment worksheets. Uh, this would say rather than have the individual signatures be anywhere in the state, it would be in the county where the economic development project is proposed or in one of the adjoining counties. Madam Chair, the next two sections are the new ones, and I'll stop there and kind of go through them. The first one deals with air permit program. The fees right now in the air permit program are based on emissions. And our emissions as a state are going down, but our air permit fees are going up. In 2019, the air permit fees were $117 per ton, and now they're estimated to be in 2022, $171. Dollars per ton. So 2019, 117, and then in 2022, they're estimated to be 171 per ton. So we think there's a disconnect there, Madam Chair and members. As emissions are going down, the fees are going up. So we're going to ask the Pollution Control Agency to look at other states in Region 5, take a look at how they do their funding for air emissions, whether it be they get more general fund money, is there an application fee, do they do construction um, permits differently, and then to report back to the legislature to see if there's a different way um, to looking at those air emission fees. Section 12 deals with some openings specifically in the air permit program at the Pollution Control Agency. Understanding in the last couple of years there has been some obviously obvious challenges uh, in hiring with COVID and a hiring freeze on, Madam Chair, but on the bottom of page 16 of the A3, this would start after one year, after uh, a position is open for one year, it would ask the agency after 60 days to post the opening, after 90 days conduct the interviews, and after 120 days start to complete the hiring of somebody in the air permit um, division. So just start to go through after a year that a position has been open, and unfortunately we've been having a lot of turnover in the air permit writers division to ask them to put some timelines around trying to hire some folks in that division. And then section 13 is also from last year. Just ask the agency to ask the EPA um, for some revisions to our state implementation plan on reissuance of permits and that the air dispersion modeling um, would not be required for simple reissuance of permits. Any new permits 
uh, any major construction changes that result in new emissions would have to do it. This is just for a simple reissuance of a Title V permit. No other state does this, and we think it puts us at a competitive disadvantage. Madam Chair, thank you, uh, and I wanted to, like I said, I just, I'll stick around for questions, but I wanted to make sure that other folks had a chance to testify. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clevin? Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Bruce Clavin. I represent a number of livestock groups here, Minnesota Turkey Growers, the Chicken and Egg Association, and Minnesota State Calamans. I just have supporting testimony from our industry on the DE, specifically on the legislative approval of fee increases. We believe that the legislature should raise the revenue, not the agency raising its own revenue. And then on the unadopted rules on lines 1.5 for the DNR, 12.3 for the PCA, we also support the provisions there. I would point out to members specifically on that language that the issue here is enforcing or attempting to enforce an unadopted rule. I think there's a difference between putting out a guideline and enforcing it. And I noted, I just grabbed the MCEA letter off the table back there and read it. Uh, for example, they say that this will effectively gag the agencies by preventing publication of any documents. It doesn't. They can publish all the guidelines they want to. The question becomes, are those enforceable? Are those legally enforceable? And the bill simply says you can't enforce them as legal documents. You can publish them all you want and help the industry comply. Those are different things. Thank you. Uh, I believe we also have uh, the MPCA and the EQB board uh, would like to testify on this. They'd like to come to the table. Oh. Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, I'm Doug Wettstein the Industrial Division Director at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, we have some concerns about this bill. Uh, I'll break it out by sections. Uh, sections 2, 4, 5, and 6. Uh, these are sections that require uh, legislative review of certain fee increases. The statute that is cited, 16A.1283, says that new fees must be approved by law. As a result, it is confusing and redundant when compared with the existing statutes, such as Minnesota Statute 115.77, uh, which is fees for wastewater treatment facility operators. And there are, are other citations that give specific program areas the authority to collect fees and have a specific set of processes, including a legislative approval process. Section 3, regulatory certainty. This was enacted in 2016 for municipal wastewater permits to provide more flexibility for incorporating changes at facilities. Industrial facilities were never intended to come under this program. This is because the regulatory certainty for municipal wastewater investments protects public investments in wastewater. Industrial facilities do not use public money, so there is no public interest in protecting that private investment. MPCA did not support including industrial facilities in this program in 2016 and does not support doing so now. Permitting efficiency, section seven. The MPCA has put in place an environmental management system to standardize permitting actions in an effort to become more efficient. Uh, this process to create online services uh, to improve and update data on facilities. We believe this process will improve and support. Uh, it'll get better with time as more and more of our permits are digitized and reissuance will move faster for many permits. Uh, however, there are also very complicated permitting situations that would prevent us from meeting established goals, such as uh, pollutants of concern and, and new first of its kind permitting strategies and trading. Uh, there could be unintended consequences if we're forced to put a permit on public notice within a specific time frame. Finally, the, sec the language in section seven conflicts with federal requirements in some cases. Uh, we can redefine the parameters we have for pulling the report, and we may have to adjust some of our tracking documentation. Uh, we receive few, if any, comments on the report. Uh, thus, requiring a report two times per year seems uh, unnecessary. Uh, Section 8 water fees is the same situation as the other uh, fees. Unadopted rules, Section 9. Language like that in Section 9 has come up in previous years, and we've opposed this language as costly and inefficient. It will slow down permitting and require significant staff time in both our industrial and remediation programs. That is because Section 9 requires that none of our guidance, policy, best management practices, and other such documents could be used until they go through rulemaking. Because of the rulemaking requirements laid out in Chapter 14, it takes about two years to complete each rulemaking 
at the MPCA. Uh, there would be considerable resources needed to put all this information into rule. The agency utilizes guidance, policy, and other documents to provide consistency, clarity, and flexibility to find creative solutions to complex permitting, enforcement, and remediation actions. In summary, many more decisions would have to be made on a case-by-case -case basis, thus increasing the time and cost to both the state and permit applicants. Section 10, Environmental Assessment Worksheet. Currently, any person who lives in or owns property in Minnesota can sign a petition for an Environmental Assessment Worksheet. Section 10 allows only those who reside in the county or an adjoining county to sign that petition. This neglects the fact that air and water do not respect county boundaries. A proposed new or expanded facility may have air and water impacts that extend beyond county boundaries. This would severely restrict public engagement and the ability of Minnesotans to have their voices heard. We oppose this because we know from experience that we get better permits when there is diverse discussion and when more perspectives are considered. Analysis of the Air Permit Program Funding Alternative, Section 11. We are not in opposition. In fact, we agree that the current air emissions fee structure is not sustainable due to decreasing pollu criteria pollutants, primarily from large coal-fired facilities being decommissioned. A study would be part of any rulemaking process. A similar analysis was completed in 2009 for air permit application fee rulemaking. The agency makes every effort to cover the costs of the program. We recognize, as this bill does, that the current per ton annual fee might need adjustments as our facilities have worked to reduce emissions. Alternative funding mechanisms should be evaluated objectively and all options open for discussion. We are being asked to do more, so fees may have to go up. The Clean Air Act requires us to fund the entire air program, including ambient air monitoring. Adequate funding will be necessary to fulfill, fulfill our obligations to protect human health and the environment. We would contract with a third party to complete the study. We're happy to work with the author going forward. Section 12, filling of certain air permit program vacancies. Uh, we do not hold air permit writer vacancies. In fact, we try to fill them as soon as possible. The real problem we face is the same thing many businesses are currently dealing with, retirements, retention, or as some are calling it, the great resignation. As was alluded to, we've had roughly 30% uh, turnover in air permit writers this past year and on into this year. The timelines do not help trying to find good candidates in a tight labor pool. If we need to repost positions or encounter other issues in the hiring process, vacancy filing is already subject to Minnesota Statute 43A. The language doesn't take into account the following. Hiring freezes that may be imposed on the agency, effective recruitment that might take more than 60 days, failed searches where the process needs to be restarted, there are no qualified candidates, or none of the candidates accept the offer that's being made. Applicants may not be available to interview within the time frames imposed. Um, and we may have a candidate who accepts the offer but cannot start after the 120 days. State Im Im Implementation Plan, Section 13. This change would limit when we can do air dispersion modeling. The language of the bill says we cannot apply a national for state air quality standard if the facility is not increasing emissions. This bill would limit our ability to evaluate air quality in environmental justice areas of concern when issuing a permit. The language would prevent us from enforcing any updated national air quality standard and possibly conflicts with the Federal Clean Air Act. Uh, this section is not in the best interest of the agency or the regulated community because of its unintended consequences. The language will slow down permit amendments, which are usually made for changes the permittee wants to be issued quickly. I'll stop there. For these reasons, uh, the MPCA opposes most of Senate File 639. Um, and I'll just note that a fiscal note request has not yet been received. Thank you. Um, with that, we have uh, EQB Board, Katie Pratt. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Katie Pratt, Executive Director of the Environmental Quality Board, and my comments this morning are on Section 10 of the bill. Um, as others have mentioned, this changes the environmental review petition process, limiting petitioners to individuals who reside or own property in the county or adjoining county of the proposed project. 
the EQB opposes this change for the following reasons. First, EQB has been reviewing citizen petition addresses, and we have found that well over the majority of them fall within or adjacent to the county where a proposed project will be located already. Therefore, this change is unnecessary. It creates a potential limitation for Minnesotans wishing to petition their government for environmental review. Second, this per Petition, or this provision would prohibit Minnesotans from signing on to a petition when they have cultural or recreational ties to the location of a proposed project but do not reside or own property in that area. Not all Minnesotans own property in the places that matter to them. This should not prevent them from requesting environmental review if they're concerned about the potential environmental impacts to those places. And then finally, as others have stated, air and water don't respect county boundaries and proposed projects could have potential for significant environmental impacts beyond the boundaries of the adjacent counties. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Members, are there questions? Oh, Senator Eaton. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't really have questions. I just wanted to um, state for the record that um, as in the past, uh, this annual bill, I, uh, I still oppose it, and I support the concerns and positions of the um, MPCA, the EQB, and the MCEA. Um, this, this, uh, this bill does not um, benefit the people of Minnesota. Thank you. Are there other questions? Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I think we're coming to the appointed time. Um, we've spent a lot of time on some of these ideas in years past, and um, Senator Ingebrigtsen, I'm sure, <clears throat> will have that opportunity again on the floor before too long, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, but uh, I'm particularly concerned about um, what Ms. Pratt just testified to uh, in Section 10. Um, so I have a question. Uh, for you, Mr. Chair, if I could. Um, if, if I were to um, uh, just take two scenarios, if I, if I owned a cabin or rent, excuse me, rented a cabin uh, up north uh, regularly, um, you know, that was, um, you know, two or three counties away from, from where I live here in Minneapolis, and um, there was a, a, a project that was going to um, have some impact uh, on the lake or the recreational area that uh, my cabin was located in. Could I sign a petition in that circumstance um, to ask for uh, environmental review or say um, I'm a, uh, you know, I fish a particular stream uh, up north and, um, and there was gonna be a project upstream, um, you know, a county or two away um, that was going to affect that fishery, could I sign a petition in that instance to ask for um, environmental review uh, to, to close, more closely examine the impacts of that project? Senator Ingebrigtsen. Would one of the folks like to answer that question? According to, according to the statute, no? According is, that your, is that what your question is, Senator Dibble? According to your uh, proposed Section 10. Go ahead. Good well, plan. <laughs> Ms. Pratt. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, according to what we're reading and interpreting here, so currently uh, the, the way the law reads is you just have to be a resident of Minnesota, so reside in Minnesota. And so this would change that to just be in the county of the proposed project or adjacent. So it would limit it considerably. So in the scenario that you're outlining, uh, Senator Dibble, my understanding is no, no, you would not be able to sign on to a petition in that case. Senator oh. Dibble. So, Mr. Chair, I would be very careful about proceeding with the provision of Section 10, because I think we will have a firestorm of opposition if it comes to light that that's what this accomplishes. Thank you. Members, if, um, oh. Madam Chair, members, I just want to clarify that I think what Senator Dibble's question is going to is the question of what constitutes residing somewhere. Is it sufficient if you rent a cabin or if you're just there for a few months out of the year? But that word reside is in the current law. And so the bill does not change the word reside. It changes the area with respect to which you're concerned about whether somebody resides or not. 
But if there's any question about what that word reside means, it's a question that exists with respect to the current law. And so whatever, however the EQB currently interprets that word, I assume is how they would interpret it if this bill were passed. Thank you. Members, are there other questions? Senator Ingerbretson, I believe this bill is to be laid over. Do you That's have correct. closing comments? No, I don't have any. I know, I know it's been an ongoing, as Senator Dibble has uh, stated, <clears throat> this has been an ongoing bill for, for, uh, for some time. And, and uh, uh, I think it takes, a, it takes a good look at here uh, of what the regulations and the fees, I think, are, are <clears throat> probably one of the most concerning things that this committee is worried about. And uh, you know, they make some pretty good points when the emissions are going down, the fees are going up. And, and uh, uh, so I'm quite concerned about that. I'm also concerned about the, uh, the last point that was made with regards to uh, uh, who, can, uh, who can sign the petition. Uh, if it's going to be a statewide petition over, over one issue and a, and a you know, minute part of, the, uh, part of our world here in Minnesota, uh, you know, maybe that's not quite so fair. Uh, but if you live real close, I think that seems to make good sense to me. So, um, with that, Madam, Madam Chair, if you can be laid over, that'd be that'd be the proper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, with that, members, Senate File 639 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, seeing no more business before this body, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.